Welcome to this September meeting of the Sustainable Development Committee. And before we begin, I'll ask Councillor Angus Morrison to, to lead us in prayer, please. Lord our God, we come before you once again, and this is the beginning of a new day. We thank you, Lord, for all your goodness to us. We thank you for the gift of life as we know it naturally here. So, a gift that we often take for granted when so many are so less fortunate than we are who are serving this day. We thank you, Lord, that we are able to meet as we are this day as a committee and as a call. You know the needs of each one gathered here and online and at home. We thank you, Lord, that you are the one who is compassionate to all. We thank you for your love and your mercy, and that once again we are on mercy's ground this day. We pray, Lord, and that we ask that you would bless the chief executive, all the officers, all members of this council, and the duties that they perform. We are grateful to you, Lord, that you are the one who upholds us and keeps us each day. We remember this day there are many who are less fortunate than we are, those who may be suffering through illness, those who may be suffering through financial issues. Oh Lord, we pray for every situation in our islands. We thank you, Lord, that this is where we are found this day. And we remember our nation as a whole at this time, Lord. We remember the royal family and all that has happened in past days. We remember the government in Westminster, and we also remember our own government in, in Hollywood. O oh Lord, we, we know that there are many difficult decisions to be made that affect everyone. But that we could put our trust in you at all times, Lord, for you are the one who leads us and guides us, and that you continue to shine on us with thy face, that the earth thy way and nations all may know thy saving grace. We pray for this committee this day, Lord, and all the deliberations, and that we ask that you would bless the chair and all his deliberations as he goes with us in the, in the agenda. Be with us now the rest of this day, Lord, and pardon us free for our many sins. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Morrison. The Gaelic translation is available for the meeting today. Please ensure that you have your headphones on if you require translation services. There are the usual housekeeping rules. I don't know if I need to go through them all again, but, but um, they're here, they're, they're, you're reminded of them anyway with regard to the conduct of the meeting. Um, if you're a member of the committee attending remotely, please leave your camera on and your microphone off. Officers attending remotely, please leave both off unless you are called to speak to report or answer the question. A reminder to members and officers in the chamber of the queuing system, the chair controls the mics. First in the queue, flashes green and the remainder are solid green. The chair will allow each flashing mic in which will change to red. Only two mics on the floor will be will be read at any one time. If you wish to come back to a question, please leave your mic on an officer speaking to the report. I would advise you to do the same. But committee members will be given a priority. In regard to declarations of interest, members must leave the chamber or end the call remotely. And finally, a reminder that the meeting has been recorded and will be made available on the CONUS website following the meeting. And can I, at this juncture, welcome uh, to the committee uh, Councillor Ian A. McNeil and Councillor Donald MacDonald. This isn't Mr. McNeil's first meeting of the committee, but he re returns representing a new ward and congratulations to him. And also to Councillor MacDonald, congratulations on his election. And we look forward to your contributions to the committee uh, during this term. Just a few remarks before we proceed with the agenda. In Quad Moor Trainee, this year, Coney and year, in partnership with MG Aweber and Screen Scotland, supported six budding media professionals to have the opportunity to work locally on a new drama in Quad Moor alongside stalwarts of the Scottish media sector on a six month training scheme. In Quad Moor, produced by Source Productions for BBC Aweber, represents a significant milestone in the creation of high quality scripted content for Gaelic audiences. The drama set amongst Hebridean textile industry has been filmed in various town locations across the Outer Hebrides 
and also in Studio Ababa. Currently in Shears Television Studio Space in Stornoway. Its director Tony Kearney, along with his colleagues, have reiterated how fantastic the studio space is and is amongst the best in rural Scotland. As well as working on the Cuomo, Taney's work with other local media companies like Wee Studio, Mac TV and Hebkelt on a range of productions developing new skills and experiences in areas which will be beneficial in their chosen careers such as production, costume, script, locations and sound. And we wish these things all the best and we recognise, as we did at the last committee, the contribution uh, this sector makes to the local economy. I want to pay tribute to Joe McPhee, who has left, who leaves the employment of, of the Corona after a, an outstanding service of 32 years on the 30th of September. He joined the Corona in December 89, and over the years has a, held a number of posts culminating in his role as Head of Economic Development and Planning. Over that period, Joe has been deeply involved with many critical economic development activities and innovations. From my perspective, he was an excellent project manager with a great ability to drive projects forward. The many projects Joe initiated and managed are too numerous to mention here, but I would like to single out one or two. First of all, the Fisheries Investment Scheme, Joe, along with the West Nile's uh, Fishermen's Association and the Royal Bank, were instrumental in setting up the scheme and has assisted dozens of young fishermen and women gain entry to the industry over the years. He was instrumental in developing the Connected Communities Project, which helped bring broadband to the islands years ahead when it would otherwise have arrived. He drove Consumer Direct, which brought high quality contact, contact centre jobs to the island. He also led, as we have, have heard earlier, the Seaforth Road Media Village Project, a project which now hosts MG Awabe, the BBC, the Stormy Gazette, with the upper floor of the studio transformed uh, to become in Hoskin. He devised the Harris Tweed Investment Fund, which was instrumental in keeping the Harris Tweed, Tweed industry uh, alive when it was at its lowest ebb. And more recently, he led and managed the Lewis Castle Museum project, which has brought an iconic, almost lost building back to productive life as a highly regarded visitor's venue and provided a home for the repurposed museum in Manila. And I want to thank Joe for his leadership in that project. This is a small sampling of the many, many projects Joe has been involved with, and he leaves a legacy of innovation and projects that have generated significant a number of, of jobs across the community. He was always a quick thinker, a good, clear speaker in both Gaelic and English with an ability to stay calm at all times. And he had a real ability to find his way to a solution, whatever it might have been. And over the next few months, we were sad to see him go, but as he will no longer be with us. But we will see, I think, uh, his legacy and the excellent service that he gave uh, to the corner will be truly missed. And it's later on that we will truly see that. So that ends the tributes. Now we move on to the agenda. With your permission, I'd like to take item 11 uh, after item one, as the Chief of Secretary is available to speak to, to that item at that time. So we are happy with that. Thank you. So item one, submit to the meeting of the 22nd of June, uh, 2022, and that's for your approval. Thank you. And we'll now move straight to item 11. This is a notice of motion and a request for a report on crofting and care charges. A notice of motion has been received from Councillor Gordon Murray and John A. McKeever. Request a report on crofting and care charges. And the, uh, the notice of motion is detailed in section five of the report. And I'll ask the Chief Executive to speak to the report and answer any questions. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for uh, bringing this item forward on the agenda. As the report notes, its purpose is to obtain a decision from the committee on whether or not a report should be provided. And for the benefit of newly elected members, this is the procedure we have, which ensures that councillors can ask that the committee consider an item, the agendas 
uh, just for the record, are issued uh, by the by the chief executive, by myself and colleagues, based on the reports from officers. But it is, of course, right that members are able to ask whether the committee wishes to consider any other item within its competence. One of the means of doing that is through a notice of motion. But that that raises the matter with the committee. It's then for the committee to decide whether it wants to take it further. So. Uh, a notice of motion was received uh, requesting a report on crofting and care charges. And um, the question for the committee is simply whether a further report should be provided whether to this committee or uh, because this is a complex matter, it would be to policy and resources committee, possibly to the integration joint board or to social work and social care committee. But um, the questions asked in the notice of motion are identical to questions which were asked in 2020. And simply for the committee's assistance and information, I've provided the answers, the updated answers to these questions in uh, paragraph 5.2 and 5.3 of the report. So I have to advise that since these questions have been asked and answered previously and updated uh, in this report, um, I would have no further report to make on this subject. Uh, if if a further report was asked, was, was sought, it would simply be this report um, with the dates changed because there is no more that officers have to say uh, on the point. So the, 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 com the committee is asked to note the report. The information is all there. I hope members uh, will note what, what is written there. Um, I can answer specific questions on these questions as far as I can. Tim Langley, Head of Law and Governance, is also available to assist. But the question before you today is simply whether is to determine this notice of motion, noting the information in the report and deciding whether you want to obtain a further report, which I have to advise would contain no further information. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chief Executive. Uh, my, my own view is that this is more relevant to the Policy and Resources Committee and to the Integration Joint Board rather than this committee. But the report is before you. If you want to see this report again on the 30th of November, if you are minded to do that. Mr Murray. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Chair. Um, I, I would move that we ask for this report. Are, are, are members minded? Do you want to see this same report again on the 30th of November? Do you have a, sec do you have a second for that, um, Mr. Murray? Mr. I'll second that. I have to declare an interest that I don't have a cross. Second okay. that. So, so we we'll move to formulate then to to, to remove formative um, vote, Mr. <coughs> Mackay. You're determining that. Are you uh, proposing that we do not have a report? I'm proposing that we don't have a report that is more relevant to policy and sources. And I'm advising Mr. Murray that we should go to PNR or the Integration Joint Board. Thanks, Chair. I think as it's in, in front of us just now, I think we can ask for a report. Uh, if you second that. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll move that. We, we don't. Mr. McDonald's. The motion. Of what were you actually? You, you're going at the direct negative, are you? But you, you, um, you move the motion is um, in an item five of the report. So, are you saying that there shouldn't be a report? I'm saying there should report if the request for the report should go to policy and resources and integration joint board. Yeah, just just to clarify your sorry, just to clarify your notes on motion. You're you're also looking to note note the, note the existing report motion. and that yes. no. Uh, no report is required. Is that correct? And, and advising that it, it's relevant for the 
it's a relevant it's a relevant matter for policy and resources committee and, and, integration, therefore jo are, and integration joint board, board and therefore a report is not required at this committee at this committee okay, okay. a further report is not for this okay so we just go directly to do you want to speak mr mr Ma mr murray first is it it's it's self oh, it's my first it's mover of the movement yes yeah. okay okay thanks for Thanks very much. Um, yes, um, as the chief executive pointed out, this this issue has been has been already addressed in a number of reports. Two previous reports have gone to the council in the last term, and I can see absolutely wh why we'd want to bring it back to to inform new members of the situation. But in terms of this committee's business, I, I don't believe it's relevant. The the aspect of crofting is there, of course, but we have nothing to do with the assignation of crofting ten tenure in this committee. We have a strategic role in terms of crofting, but not in these terms. So I think it would be more relevant in terms of clear charges, it's more relevant to Policy and Resources Committee and to the Integration Joint Board. But at the same time, as I have said, this has a, all the issues that have been asked today in your notice of motion, Mr. Murray, have already been addressed and updated. Um, in two previous in two previous occasions, so there is no new information. So if we were asking for another report, if the committee were to ask for another report to go to November, it would be exactly the same report that is in your agenda papers today. So I would move as as Mr. Mackay has has uh, indicated uh, that we that we this be deferred to the that we note the report and that the committee doesn't require any further report and that Mr Murray should seek further information from Policy and Resources Committee and the Integration Joint Board. Thank you. Now it's Mr Mr Murray. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I think it was on the 6th of May 2020 when we last debated this item at full council and the agreement, the recommendation at full council was it was agreed to defer consideration of this matter to a future meeting of the Corla. Now, there was subsequent uh, questions asked at a full council later on, and uh, there was quite a number of questions asked, but the substantial response we got to the questions is there's no policy. There's no policy on this item. So, as our role as councillors, we need to be policy makers and I don't know if you've seen it, but the Accounts Commission have brought up in the Best Value Report uh, due to be published on the 29th of September. It makes it clear, makes it clear that they have real concerns. They've expressed concerns about members not being involved in council strategy. And this is our response to set a policy where there's a policy vacuum. Now, we can debate the, the substance of the issue when we get the report and we can make a decision. And that's all we're doing now as elected representatives is to bring this issue so that we can debate it and have uh, basically fulfil the, the decision that was made on the 6th of May 2020 to, to consider and move forward. I mean, I think that is pretty reasonable. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Yes, Mr. Mr. MacDonald, Mr. Chairman. Second. Second. Uh, it's on your mic. Uh, I, again, um, we, we've I think we've batted this around a couple of times before, and I don't know quite how it sits within this committee. As the as the chair has, has already said, uh, it's a matter for policy and resources. I think um, we've. In the absence of, a, like Councillor Murray said, and if we don't, if we have a vacuum in policy here, then obviously that needs to be addressed. But um, my own position on the matter is, uh, I think I've explained it before. Um, we we we've debated whether we've taken in a substantial amount of money and whether we have a two-tier system in operation. Going forward, I think that's that's the that's the debate whether we, we do or don't have a two-tier system going forward. So, um, I, I I don't know where the correct 
forum for this discussion would be. Uh, I think at sustainable yeah. development, possibly uh, it, it doesn't sit with us, uh, possibly with um, with policy and resources or with the integrated mm -hmm. joint board. Um, I think it's one for for wider debate. Yes. So. Uh, uh, as the, uh, the chair has already said it's possibly one for another forum, and uh, I think it's possibly best sat there. Okay, thank you, Mr. McDonald. Mr. McKenzie. Uh, sorry, can I bring the chief executive? Sorry, chair, I'm not intervening in a in a policy debate, but simply no. for information, um, we are not in a policy vacuum here because the Corliss stated position is that social care should be free at the point of delivery as health care is free at the point of delivery for all people in the Western Isles, whether crofters or not. That is the policy position of the Corla and that that is our that is what has been communicated in various consultations and responses. So that, that is that is our policy and that is why, just for information, there is no policy on these technicalities in one to four of, of Croft of Croft tenancies and the conditions attaching to them because our policy position is that all social care should be free as all health care is free yeah. at point of delivery. Thank you for that information. Mr McKenzie to second Mr Murray. Thank you. Thanks Chairman. Um, yeah, well, I didn't expect to be second in this today, but um, and I'm not quite sure why it was brought forward. Um, but uh, the fact is that um, at the previous uh, council meeting, when this was brought up, it was stated that we have no policy. We have uh, one, two, three, four different items. We have no policy. Well, we should have a policy. We either agree with it or we don't agree with it, but. Uh, the fact is, there should be some council policy on this matter, and that's why I, I you know, no, no hesitation. And in, in, despite what the chief executive says here, yeah, um, it's up to the councillors to to make uh, the, uh, policy. Um, and I, I feel that we should we should uh, proceed. And, uh, whether it's uh, on this committee or PNR. It certainly should be a matter that's discussed and a decision taken on. Thank you. Any members want to win? Uh, sorry, I didn't realise this was going to be brought forward. This was supposed to be towards the end. Of yes, the... I'll tell you why it was brought forward, Ms. McKeever, because the chief executive was another engagement mm -hmm. and he asked that it be brought forward. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's vital that we have a policy. We're, we're the council with the most crafts in the whole world, and not to have a policy on these issues is just, just terrible. And uh, you know, we, we're here. Well, all we want is a report at this time. We don't really want to discuss the ins and outs. Uh, what we need is to have a, a report back, and to have maybe a seminar or, a, or a, a special meeting to form policy for the council here. I think it's ridiculous that we're, we're desperate to get houses for young people. And here we are taking houses from these young people. So it's something that we have to look at. Thank you. Any other contributions from members online or? Chief Executive. I'm, I'm conscious. Sorry, Mr. Sorry, sorry. I'm conscious there are a number of new new members elected in May, and perhaps some guidance on the background to this issue is is um, would would be helpful. Um, I mean, I, I have to be absolutely clear with the committee. The recommendation in relation to matters one to four is that the caller does not need to have, should not have, and cannot have. A policy position, and if if members wish to suggest what that policy position would be, I would be happy to discuss it. But the, the issues the issues of recovery of social care charges are wider than these technicalities of crofting tenancy, and I have no idea what policy 
um, the corridor we'd wish to have in respect of these matters. If the issue is about the wider issue of charging for social care, whether for crofting uh, tenants or or any other resident, uh, that is that is a wider policy matter, and I'm happy to inform members in a seminar or any other format of the issues involved. I suspect that my 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 advice would be that would be more productive than a. Uh, than returning to a report on matters on which officers will say there is no policy to be had because these are not matters which concern us. Mm. These are matters between crofting tenants, the landlords and the crofting commission. Our issue is the recovery of lawful debt incurred for social care charges, and that is a wider policy issue on which members have already expressed a policy position, which is that social care should be free at point of delivery, whether you are a crofter uh, or any other resident. And that is our policy. Any other contributions? Yeah. Mr McCormack? Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I have been puzzled all along in the course of the, the number of times this matter has come forward as to why it should apply only to crofters. Everybody uh, is in the same position as far as this is concerned, as far as the Scottish Government is concerned. And if we're going to have a policy, then it has to be a policy that applies to everybody. And our policy uh, at the moment is that care should be free at the point of delivery. That is our policy, and I support that 100%. And I'm really very concerned that the new national care policy is not going to allow that to happen. And that's going to be a really big fight for us. But I cannot see what merit there is in bringing any further information before us. There is nothing we can do. Our policy is clear. We don't believe that there should be a charge whether you're a crofter or no. And that's our policy. I don't see what else we can add to that. Thank you, Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, yes, I do agree with a lot of what Councillor McCormack was saying there at the start, definitely. Uh, I, I can't agree, Chair, with uh, the, the slight comment you had yourself about this shouldn't come under sustainable development because we all know it's a hot topic out in the crofting community regarding croft tenancies being sold, etc., on the open market. Now, if we weren't to discuss this under sustainable, uh, it'd be very difficult for the, any crofter willing to listen because what I'm trying to say is they relate to sustainable development as the committee that will be discussing crofting. They're likely to come and listen to a sustainable development meeting, knowing that crofting issues co could come up rather than at PNR at full council. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McLeod. So, any other? So, we move to summing up. Mr. McNeil. Thank you, Chair. If we were to to agree to 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 put it to, to, to PNR, would it would it be the same report we would we would get at PNR? It would be. There, there's no subst there, I can't see any substantive changes to it. So so what's the purpose of putting it to PNR if it's because it's more relevant in terms of care, ch care charges. Yeah, the financial but, if it, but if it's the same report, we're, going to, we're, we're not going to move on. Any well, further. the offer of a seminar has been made. Did you want to come in there? Simply just say that, Chair. I mean, if, if these specific questions are asked at PNR or any other committee, the answers will be the same. <laughs> um, if, and so, in my opinion, um, the, the matter doesn't advance very far. Uh, if new members would find it of benefit to to um, to discuss or be aware of the issues behind the report or the various issues around uh, charging for social care, I'd be happy to arrange a seminar and a brief seminar in due course, either for members of the committee or for all members of the corner. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Steele. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think it's quite clear that members want to have a discussion around this, so I think the, the offer of a seminar seems to be the, the most sensible way forward. So we can maybe just have a, 
talk amongst ourselves and see if there's anything that we want to talk around the, the issue. There might be approaching the government about the, the position or maybe the Crofters Commission. So Spray, I can't hear you. I'm saying it might be um if we're going to talk to the, the government or the Crofters Commission about the situation, it might be worth having a seminar to bring our thoughts together. I'm quite open to a seminar, but I think I can remind members that we have made a, a submission on the consultation to the, the, the care bill outlining our position on this issue and outlining our position that we want care to be, be free at, at, at the point of delivery. And we have reiterated that time and time again, and that is our policy. But if um, if members are open to a seminar, by all means. Councillor Murray, George Murray. Thank you. Uh, as a new member, I would welcome some to be more informed on this. Absolutely, whether it's been debated before or not. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Some form of seminar, some uh, degree of more, of more information for us. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Well, can I? So, are you are you prepared to withdraw your notice of motion in in order that there be a a seminar? You want to proceed with the the vote? Okay. Absolutely, we'll sum up in due course. Yeah. No, no. I think it's I think it's myself first, isn't it? To uh, sum up. Uh, no. Uh, What's the Okay. Yes. That, by all means. Yeah. Technically, the amendment in the summary. The amendment is in your name, Mr. Murray. So you're some. Uh, can I just say that we've followed the standing orders, myself and Councillor McKeever, and we've submitted a, a notice of motion as per the standing orders, quite correctly. Mm -hmm. um, there was no mention of any appropriate committee, and it was. Mr. Barr, the Chief Executive, who signed off that notice of motion, uh, that request, he's a contact officer. So he, there was no mention of appropriate committee or anything like that. So we followed the correct procedure. We've asked for this to, debate it, to be debated. It's interesting that the Chief Executive has intervened three times in what was a formal debate and bringing new information. So I think the integrity of this debate has been compromised severely. So what we're wanting is to have a debate. We're wanting just a report, that's all. The answers to the questions was there, no, there, there was no policy. So to say there is a policy is, is a bit kind of confusing. We have no policy on this issue. All we want to do is fulfill our role as, uh, as councillors, as elected representatives, and have a debate on it. And I, I'm, I'm very disappointed about the way this has been handled, to be honest. Thanks. Well, I don't I don't agree with you. Also, I don't agree with you, Ms. Murray, that the, the integrity of the debate has been compromised in any way. I mentioned, it was my personal view, I said at the very start, that I thought it would be more appropriate that this be discussed at P PNR or at the Integration Joint Board, that it really didn't fall under the remit of this committee, other than the fact that there was crofting mentioned and crofting in terms of tenancies been exchanged and so forth. Um, I think Mr. Burr could come in and that couldn't have been, uh, I'll ask him to intervene again to clarify, to clarify standing orders on exactly why he could come in to this debate for the information. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, for well, the avoidance of any doubt, the chief executives did not sign off any notices of motion. These are from the members who submit them, and it is they who sign them off. Um, they are then passed to Mr. Mackay for 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 administration in, in the proper way. I had I had information to give on council policy, uh, chair, and you, uh, and it's entirely at your discretion. Uh, we're happy that I give that information because it was being suggested that we were in a policy vacuum on this issue, and that, in my opinion is not the case, uh, but members can evaluate that information as just as you can choose to receive it or not. Uh, that is your discretion as chair of the meeting, mm -hmm. but I would suggest that the information is at least relevant. Indeed, thank you. So I know in, in, in any way questioned the integrity of the way you put forward, Mr. McKeever put forward the notice of motion. 
our policy is that we want care to be allowed free at the point of use. As I said, that has been that these representations have been made to government, as I hope you've made them as well uh, during the, the consultation period uh, for the National Care Service. Um, it's an issue that's really important to us all and we care about. We all agree, we're all united on the fact that we of, of the issue that's been brought up here, but we need action from central government and a policy position where care is delivered free at the point of use. So families do not have to, you know, give up uh, property and assets that have been precious to them for generations. So I don't think I have anything more to add at the moment. So I think we'll just proceed to the vote. And the procedure is that those, the motion is in my name, um, and Mr. Mackay can remind, can you remind members of, of the motion? Thank you, Chair. The motion uh, is uh, in the name of the Chair, seconded by the, the Vice Chair, and it is to note the, the report uh, that this is a matter for Policy and Resources Committee, uh, uh, more appropriately a matter for Policy and Resources Committee and the Integration Joint Board, and that a further report is not required. The amendment is in the name of Councillor Murray, seconded by Councillor Mackenzie, and it is that a further report uh, be submitted on the basis of the six points in the notice of motion. Is that correct, Mr. Murray? Yeah. Do you want to do? Uh, we have a couple of the member members of the committee online. Do you wish a roll call? I think a, a roll call would be fine. And just to remind that it's only members of the committee that can vote. This. Okay. Yeah. So, so sorry. When you're voting, if you can clearly say motion or amendment. I remind you, motion is the name of the chair, seconded by Councillor Macdonald. Amendment in the name of Councillor Murray, seconded by Mr. Mackenzie. So, when I call out your name, if you can clearly say motion or amendment. Chair. Motion. Uh, Vice Chair. Councillor Ian A. McNeil. Councillor Paul Steele. Councillor Mustafa Hussein, Councillor Ushan Robertson, Councillor Grant Fulton, Motion, Councillor Robert Mackenzie, Councillor Angus Morrison, Councillor Norman uh, Misty MacDonald, Councillor John Norman MacLeod, Councillor Kenneth MacLeod, Councillor Donald McSween, Motion. Uh, Councillor John A. McKeever, Councillor Ian M. McCauley, Councillor Duncan McInnes, Councillor Gordon Murray, Councillor Ray McKenzie, Councillor An Angus Murray, ah, sorry, Angus McCormack, sorry, uh, Councillor Francis Murray. <laughs> Here, that is 13 for the motion, 7 for the amendment. Thank you. So, okay, then the motion is carried. And the request, if there's a request for a seminar on this issue, by all means, members, are, the, the chief executive is open for that to take place in due course. We now move on to item 3, it's a performance management item. The report is for noting and provides an overview of the community Department's business plan and rate of performance economic development planning at quarter one. And the Je Deputy Chief Executive will speak to this report. More than thank you, I'm in the room, the shop, and I have Joe come over in you. Uh, a town hall here at Castell and a pre and pre emission are a re marpaho or guitaraget. A chair point to him in a shouting. Uh, and the pre of an attacker and a gach sheravash. I'm a doctrine who appoint a fat, a clock appoint no ga, a hot girl had it. A sheravish dualish, could a sheravish of own and has been a yellowen alabe, but here at Nech, a wahar, it is here at Tachertis, as given Heravash tight reprogram at Fergne Hillenen. Planach and Heravash trang let here to tie here to Shia, here at this and as a here at Karstal. Schneer Gnochus, Erisht, 
Trang, Latia Dai hits a three year at the city at Karstel. In program Yesochi Koyanshnoch, Fayim Plane, a mean of Timel Hashinul Kosk, a Venachis, a Stech Gurieltus Nahalape, Bidriak, a ye, a son officer, coordinachi, a own a son. I'm sorry for stopping you. I've got a, there's a message from Mr. Fulton online that he has not given a Gaelic translation. Yeah. Right. So, so, sorry, Chair. Yeah. Sorry, Chair. There are there are an, uh, email instructions around for getting the Gaelic translation uh, online. We've set up a conference bridge where people can join into. I can get that. I can email those details to Councillor Fulton just now. Yes, but, but in the meantime, I think Mr. McKeever can proceed in, in English if that's okay. Some members are not going to get your point the Gaelic translation. If, if, uh, if the committee is happy for me to proceed in English, I will do so. Can you all um, understand English? <laughs> okay, then, Chair, you know, just for the, the efficient running of the committee, I'll continue in English. Um, you were doing very well there as well, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hang on, Sonia. So, just to, just to pick up then where I left off, uh, RCGF Rural uh, Capital Grant Fund, uh, we submitted a number of requests to the Scottish Government and four requests uh, have been successful and they will now proceed to uh, the second round of uh, of RCGF assessment. Uh, these were uh, the North Used Heritage Programme, Shalach uh the Colony Centre and the Business Centre at Loch Carnan. Uh, we've employed a, an officer for the US repopulation zone. That officer has been in post now for a number of, of months and is taking forward uh, a range of the key actions uh, under the US repopulation plan. Uh, I think it's been very interesting, you know, the, the, the outcomes or some of the, the, the requests we're seeing coming through to the officer. So, for example, there have been 61 requests of people looking for information about uh, relocating to US. So that, that's a, a mix of people from from the US diaspora that can put it like that. People with US connections working on the mainland who, who are looking for a route, route to return uh, and people who wish to uh, are considering moving themselves and potential businesses to US. So I, I think that number of inquiries in the first uh, period of a project is is quite uh, uh, heartening. Uh, financial performance is outlined at 8.1. Uh, I would draw your attention to the, the spend figures in under economic development, which shows uh, a, quite a high level of spend. This is normal for the service who do a lot of uh, expenditure uh, and then recoup that money from grant either through government, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and other agencies. So although the spend looks high at this point, that will regularise out through the course of the year. And we anticipate coming through on budget uh, as outlined in the report. Uh, happy to take any questions on that, Chair, and to note some of the service managers are uh, online in case there's any questions of detail about any of the individual service areas. Thank you, Mr. McHugh, and I apologise for interrupt, uh, interrupting you during your presentation. Any questions from members? Chair. Houston. Yeah, it's just to ask the director if the local members in Houston Barra could get more information about what's going on in relation to the repopulation plan. Uh, Colin McKenzie gave me some information from a meeting he attended last week, I think it was, but you know, it would be of use to us if we had more information of what's going on as local members. Yes, Chair, more than happy to do that. A substantive report went to the last committee outlining the, the overview of the plan. But it'd be useful, I'd be happy to put together a, a mini seminar, if I could call it that, with, with you as members just to talk our way through uh, the action plan, what's in it and what we see happening over the next period. 
anyone else want to come in? If not, uh, the members are, are asked to agree a no to report. Oh, sorry, Mr. McLean. Mr. McLean. Thanks, uh, Chair. I'm not a member of your committee, but uh, it's to do with a bit of clarification on 6.6. It's to do with community led local development. Uh, it's just a, a clarification, actually. There's, uh, how, how do we employ community CLD officers? Yes, Chair, we do, but this is a slightly different yes. programme. This is a, a, like a successor programme in a way to the leader programme. That's why it has been administered through the local action group. Uh, so it is slightly different from you know the, the traditional Corlea employed CLD officers. So what you're saying is that those local employed CLD officers will not have an input into this? I'm sure there's a potential for them to advise and be informed and input into it in some way, but it isn't a CLD programme in, in the traditional sense of CLD. It's a, it's a successor programme to, to leader in a way. It will be run through economic development. And, and as I said earlier, we are hope we are interviewing someone to look after that programme uh, in a, at the beginning of October. Yeah, it's just a lead in to say, and this is where I come, is, is there's a shortage of CLD officers, as I'm sure you're aware. Our, our area, for instance, the chair's area, do not have a CLD officer. So when it comes to projects like this, with the help of, 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 of fees being distributed, then, then areas that do not have CLD officers will be at a disadvantage. I'm just pointing that out as, a, as a, an observation. I think that uh, is a fair comment, Chair, and that there are parts of, of the Outer Hebrides that are quite well served by uh, community development officers and other areas which are, uh, you know, very short or have no none at all uh, development officers. So I think one of the things that, that we want to achieve through the community engagement unit is a fairer, if you like, you know, utilisation or distribution of, of community uh, officers so that every community has an opportunity to utilise one of these officers. Absolutely. Ms. Councillor Morrison. Thank you, Chair. Just following on Councillor McLean's question there. I feel wrongly, I was led to believe that the CLD was going to be disbanded and, and taken into this new team. Is that correct? Because we're now in the same situation in Locks where we don't have a CLD officer because the CLD officer we had is actually left post now. So we're in a similar situation. I think I've raised this before that if this is a new team, that we, we should be having somebody full time in each area for the help of development in each area. So it's just a bit of clarity because, you know, I, maybe I picked you up wrong because I, I think you said that the CLD officer was still in post, but then I was led to believe that this was going to be a new development team with your own existing pre-development team that was only one team. So just clarification on that, please. Yes, Chair, we might be talking at slightly cross purposes here. There's two different programmes. There is the community-led local development, the CLLD, which is that, that sort of successor to leader, uh, which is you know a, a one-off programme uh, of funding coming through the Scottish Government, which acts as a successor to, to leader. We will be looking to recruit an officer worth for that because that comes with an officer as part of it. That is completely different and separate from CLD in the traditional sense that the Coronia has employed community learning and development officers. So the, the CLD officers uh, who are in the Education and Children's Services Department, along with uh, regeneration officers from uh, economic development, will come together into the new community engagement unit. So we've been recently recruited a team leader for the engagement unit, and the engagement unit is presently just being brought together uh, and set up. So you will be hearing more on that in due course, but I think we've got to be clear there's two slightly different programmes here. And it's unfortunate that the, the CLD and the CLLD have very similar names. Chief Executive, do you want to come in? Not now, OK. Jameson Morrison? Yeah, could I just come back on, on clarification here? So we still we still at this current time got a CLD program. Is that correct? 
or are we waiting to get this new team set up? Because like Councillor McLean, LOCS is now, do, but we don't have a worker to assist the groups. And, and that is of a concern to all the organisations within LOCS, and I, and I believe back's the same. So it's just, it's just a clar clarification of where we are going forward. If there is still CLD workers out in post in various wards, is this being looked at to be re something to be redeployed where there are other development workers in the same ward to help the wards that don't have any like their own? Yes. Yes, Chair, the CLD officers still exist, so that they are doing the, the job that they've been done doing over the past year. They, they are at the moment about to be reformatted into the community engagement unit, and then that is where we would hope to have that better distribution uh, across across the island. So that hasn't quite happened yet, uh, but we'd hoped that that will be happening in the not too distant future. And I, I'm going to bring the chief executive in, Mr. Moses. Yes, Jill, just to add to that very briefly, I mean, the whole purpose of the review was to recognise that the resource in CLD has fallen, as it has across every Corvus service for the reasons you all know, and is to bring together and coordinate all of those officers whose primary function is community empowerment, development, engagement to ensure equity across the Western Isles, and also to take into account the resources that other bodies such as community landlords have. So we have so we have coordination and we have equity uh, across the Western Isles. But the community learning and development function is a statutory one. We have a plan, uh, we have a policy which you've approved, uh, and we will stick to that. But resourcing it uh, is the question, and that that is what is what will come through the um, the community the, the community engagement uh, unit uh, within our own department. So that. Um, th that's that's the plan. The time scale, uh, the time scale will be as quickly as as quickly as possible. Now that the now that the arrangements for the appointment of a team leader um, have been made. Thank you, Chief Taylor. Okay, thank you. We're we're going to that's for noting that report. Right. Mr. McInnes, Council McInnes. Yeah, just for a bit of clarification, you know, for members, you know, the com community led de local development program of which both yourself and myself were on the committee, that funding of about a quarter of a million has to be spent in this current financial year. And a handful of things have been developed and submitted to the Scottish Government, and they have accepted that those go forward. So that's been decided well that level of funding is going to be spent by the group that have taken over as the follow up from the from the leader group. And we hope that after April next year, that there would be a follow up to the, the leader program in some shape or form that would be community led. That's my understanding of the situation. That's correct. Yeah. Mr. McLean. I think thanks, Chair, for letting me again. I think what the Chief Executive and what the Director has said about reorganisation of the CLD or whatever makes eminent sense, absolutely first class sense, because the CLD officer, as, as everybody knows, was doing a very, very good work, but it was not entirely on learning. It was on development as well. The, the scope was greater than on learning. So to, to take them into the education only was was probably remiss in, in one way. But to, to the, the ideas that, that are coming forward, but I would see that, that what Mr. McInnes has said there, with the money having to be spent within the, this financial year, then I would say that that means that the, the, the reorganisation has to go on a pace and a greater pace than, than we thought. So I'm just mentioning the fact that, that what we're what is proposing is, is, a, is an excellent uh, proposal. Thank you, Mr. McLean. So the report is for noting at uh, 3.1 there. And please forgive me, I, I need to go back to item two, the declaration of, I didn't do the declaration of interest. Members are asked to declare any interest they have in any items of the agenda. It would be helpful if members expressed why they declare an interest in the item to concern. Members in the chamber, chamber, please do so by pressing your microphone on or remotely through Teams by using the raise hand function. Please ensure the declaration is repeated prior to the relevant item and you adhere to the protocol as previously indicated. Are there any, 
members want to declare? No, it's fine. I'm just looking at how some of Oh, that's that's always I. So that's fine. That's that's fine. So we now, I uh, just to add that the uh, uh, that the Gaelic translation is now available to all members. I believe everyone is able to access the translation. So you're free to speak in whatever language you want, members or officers. We move on now to item four of the performance management report for the first quarter 22-23. And that for our committee's interest, that's going to be covering um, the housing services and energy, I think. Yeah. The report is for noting provides an overview of the Queen's Directorate business plan, progress and related performance <coughs> for quarter one. Data of relevance to this committee at housing services uh, and energy. And there are specific reports on housing later on, as you will see in the agenda. There are a number of developments in relation to energy since the end of the quarter, and the director will provide an update to members. Deputy Chief Executive. <laughs> A bowl of the committee. A had taken this eight yar in Shia point to Tehat, Sir Ashina Shalt in Faravich in Lisha program Tehat this. Ashin in the last Tokal Tiat Tehat, a Tehun Ur, Agis Ha Tehun Ur, Ella as a flan adult for planning it in Yerisho. A ha ham program at Yanuk Leva, had Yanu Marva do like in it in Yerisho. Is Marahood to ha and plan a son of Leona Shot or the other yes, but Miss Atia a third as a war. A book in Connie na na Ulochain it in Yerisho, Mana is again her priest in Jalan Dorsuas, her realtors writing the other Hinestech Le Cap as priest in Jalan, exashin to the heart big and fewer to her other hoosh, a has cash in the feet in Koskishin Dorsuas. Uh, is a prison in Yalan that we both can hear about this. Stockle real to see the mark the 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 rotten ears that you have in here going. I have I had had a overdrug man I have bought in Kony to see us as in here. I have a brand new real to see how that we could just I have a new is you've lived in that he the mark the scheme ears as in the shirt going in the heen. Son Tartai Tri, the Bokin as a Hoyersnock. Eight point Shia point to her dear Cashinabreen Mayen Kuark. Mananahish is a screever ha at the teen go a cool a heat carstal, a hator a tachert for name a Kaisho screever. And Priam Fruta had tachert a tra the newer who had. To an is gay storm of office, grow at Seravakol, Lusha CFD. Ashina Titch, it in Imshin, grow a CFD shin, gri, and point my other son, SSE, Kurishtech, needs case go off gym. A new lark at Hanit had the Continuish Holistic Network Design, a mark for, for, for National Grid. Fashion is shouting, grow coramon, grid ears, le un point och gigawatts a hin for Nihilan and Shears, gone a grid. With a SSE of Canton, of Coolidge, and Nahalit machine, dollar third, le she grid, eoritis go off gem, it shea tiered megawatts, glad of a good rock, go twenty thirty, a son, a one point eight. In order to attach the coalition before Connell to a hinamach for off Jemma Shalton Caro in a point Oak Casho, Haro in a point Oak as a as a new this for off Jem. Machine had taught me Shane Downish, they had SSE against their off Jem at a Nidishak, a Dury Tachert of the grid. As in the Nazi, we bring the Rigach Buyan against her Navrishak Dul, Nakhalshina Fal, Sayadok Sabi. For SSE new off gem, Hanaga and Adisha can count in protein tours at the reality. Mershon Hamismunoch Gavil Tor Oberianu as Nishak in Rehin, 
fjern de puter SSI ögus of gem son far sayarach de hatachet other grid hamis munyoch a tosher in yucher na the hanit of skru to an sky's john with the fans cfd fashion is munyoch kru si other down in washin for naimshin hashin yath kaul sayarach other lesion exams munyoch kri bishik dul more hound given pornoch and more economic uh hawaip uh requak and wakal Nachalshin Fal gone a poor knockenshin. So I miss Munoch a fame shin, a tort yes, but as tort brain as a shake in the heen, Rigach, a SSE, August of Jim, a hammy tolity agglichin, Rigahara, a hammy tolity gold chest and kitty. Papalets, Deputy Cowan. I just wanted to um, perhaps just to thank you for your update, um, Sokiva, just to reiterate the frustration disappointment we all feel about the way SSC and Ofgem have been behaving recently over the, the transmission issue. It's like it, it, it's it's we can't deny our, our anger and frustration about the way we've been treated and a further delay on trying to tackle uh, the energy crisis that is upon us and also the climate uh, crisis that is upon us and we have the greatest resource in the world, and we are unable to utilize it and to channel it uh, for the benefit of the wider country and to the benefit of our local communities because of the stringent regulations that have been imposed and the, you know, the obstacles that have been put in our way time and time again, year after year, in delaying, you know, the opportunity for prospering our, our economy here locally. And I think it's really important that we now make the strongest representations uh, to to Westminster and to to Hollywood about about the failure of Ofgem and of SSC in regard to to this issue. And I'd, I'd be I'd be happy if you would agree to add additional recommendations uh, to this report uh, that would go in the following. That given the ongoing failure of the tran transmission owner SSEN transmission and the regulator of GEM to consent and deliver grid to the Outer Hebrides, so Sukola has lost all confidence in both organisations to deliver transmission connectivity uh, to the Outer Hebrides. And two, given the failure of both organisations and the subsequent loss of confidence, the Sukola calls on both the UK and the Scottish Government to immediately reconstitute the Scottish Islands Delivery Forum in order to resolve and deliver grid connectivity in the Outer Hebrides. I'd be grateful if you could agree to these additional recommendations uh, to this uh, report. Agreed? Thank you. Yes. Mr McCormack. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I 100% agree with you. Um, I, th I thought in 614, the initial statement that is continuing uncertainty over grid connection for the islands is possibly one of the biggest understatements that's ever been made in this chamber. Um, and it's been a very disappointing time uh, for the council. And, and, and I know that I have made my feelings on this known to all council members prior to today. Um, I, I, just don't know how officers must feel who have spent, certainly since I've been in this council in 2003, working on this particular issue uh, to get to the stage where we are just now, where we haven't the first idea what the future holds for us. I think that is a disgraceful situation uh, to be in, and I 100% agree with your suggestion of contacting uh, SSEN of GEM and uh, the, the governments. Um, I would like to suggest that uh, perhaps there is a window of opportunity for us here. If nothing is going to happen until 2030, uh, then there are eight years in which we might do something uh, uh, more locally if we can just persuade SSEN and of GEM to allow us to do that. It's absolutely imperative, for example, that the two new 
interconnectors to Uist are put in place. There's no way that they cannot do that. It would be absurd not to do that. But I would also argue that there is a very powerful argument for putting in the second cable, which unfortunately they didn't do, to Sky from Harris. And um, that would give uh, local developers uh, of renewables, both north and south, an opportunity to attach themselves to the grid. Now, I know it's not as simple as that. I know that there are many, many issues uh, around the questions of, of uh, not just connectivity, but also whether it's a distribution or a trans... I can't remember what the other word is. Um, in terms of moving electricity around, but these are these are just technicalities. After all, it's just a wire uh, with electricity running through it, and how you designate it is neither here nor there, really, at the end of the day. So what I'm going to ask you, Chair, is do you not think that we should set up um, a means of bringing our own local aspirations for further developments in renewables uh, to a head during this period of eight years when nothing, uh, our, our, our international supporters are not going to be able to do very much except prepare for the future. Um, perhaps we could do something. And the reason that I would argue that this is a good idea is that even at this moment, um, up until fairly recently, uh, local developers were producing £2 million worth of resource into the Outer Hebrides, which is not to be sniffed at. At the present moment, because of the amount of money that's been paid out, that figure could double. And I believe there is still a great deal of um, enthusiasm in our communities for extension to renewables. And I wouldn't say this should just be wind farms. I, I, I know there is also people looking at um, uh, what run of water uh, establishments as well. So I'm just asking if you think that we perhaps should take this matter forward uh, as a priority. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. McGowan. I, I would welcome the opportunity for um, a show of unity at long last between uh, various interest groups in this sector and renewable interest sector, working together in partnership rather than working against each other. I think I would welcome that and would certainly look forward to some sort of discussion going forward. But I think at the same time, it's really important that we seek intervention at the very top in terms of the case and, and the re-establishment of, of the delivery forum is really important. I think we should push for that because nothing is going to happen really without a connection with this cable. So that is a priority, but certainly absolutely working together in partnership with unity of purpose with various groups in the community. I would absolutely welcome that. Welcome that. Mr. Sorry, Mr. Staffa, and then I'll take in Mr. McLean. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a, a quick remark. Just wanted to somebody that's been involved with the with the uh, renewable project in the US for years. Just wanted to add my voice to the strength of feeling that the chair expressed and 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 what we should um, obviously emphasize on how the community feels. And I totally support what he said, Chair. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Mr. McLean. I think Mr. Oh, sorry, Mr. McInnes and then Mr. McLean. Okay. Yeah, just following on, I was just wondering what the feed. George. George. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry, I was wondering what the feedback from the developers are, you know, to the further delay, because all delays, as Councillor McCormack has indicated, you know, if we're waiting another eight years from doing nothing, you know, there's going to be escalating costs. Albeit, you know, that energy costs and the return on investments are going to be greater for the developers. I was wondering what the feedback from the developers have been. Either have they taken a negative stance or are they, are they still proceeding with 
the proposals as originally planned. They've been remarkably patient, given all the delays that have taken place. But I'll let Deputy Chief Executive come to your Thank you. Yes, yes, Chair, I think the developers all remain engaged as you'd anticipate. They are hugely disappointed if the delivery date for the interconnector is being pushed back. I think from our perspective, yes, the 1.8 gigawatt interconnector is there, but it seems like what's been happening over the years, it's jammed tomorrow. Uh, I, I think you know we, we've got three terrestrial projects that, that can go ahead. I think we should be pushing for the 600 megawatts, you know, to be submitted on the needs case as was the plan until the holistic network design came forward. Uh, there is no guarantee of the 1.8 uh, gigawatt happening. Uh, all the work has been done on the 600 megawatts, so uh, I, I would say we push forward on on that. Uh, that is the developer's preferred solution, uh, and I think that is the solution that delivers economic benefits at, at the, the nearest point in time. I think you know both uh, both uh, the transmission and distribution networks are at total capacity. So nothing can happen, be it the commercial projects, be it the community projects, until we get some form of of, of new grid. You know, we as a community are, are totally 100% stymied. So you know, my my view and my recommendation is that we we push them all to to try and get the 2027 600 megawatt connection uh, in place uh, as soon as possible. Uh, and allied to that, I understand that Ofgem have rejected. Uh, what was in SSE Distribution's uh, ED2 uh, business plan for replacing the US cables. So that, that has been rejected by Ofgem. So I think that is another Finally. huge cause of concern and another huge priority that we need to be engaged with uh, SSE Distribution, uh, Ofgem uh, and both governments on. Thank you. Mr. McLean and then Councillor McSween. I think you had your hand up, your wee hand. Anyway, Mr. McLean, sorry. Uh, thanks, Chair. Again, I'm not a member of your committee. I, I, I think uh, Mr. McKeever has, has, has said exactly what I was going to say. I think to take in another amendment to your own amendment, which is absolutely correct. I think what we should do is put pressure on Ofchem and SSE from the outset right now to try to change back to, to the 2027. To start taking in other amendments would confuse the issue quite now we have to say and i have to say this that this has been going on for over 20 years and the delay is not entirely of chem and sse some of them are of our own making in our own communities there's been legal action and upon legal action upon legal action by some bodies so really at the end of the day we're at this we're at the time at the moment we're at is we, if what you rightly say in your amendment is we have to put pressure on SSE and on Ofchem and the government in particular, because as Mr. McKeever says, the network is full. To put in a second cable from Sky to, to Harris is not, not feasible because the network from Mr. McKeever can probably confirm this from Sky onwards is full. So therefore, there is no necessity to put in a second uh, cable. So therefore, we should strive in your amendment, Chair, and actually go for it. And I'm glad that came in uh, today. Thank you, Mr. McLean. I think, Mr. McSween, are you still? I well, I talking about the graph. I graph. I'm just going to take your turn. Would the hurt your pain? Let's just mollo you back up back um I guess could you look at in this macaronic I mean I mean going to go to the college and could you look at I'm in your head and give her again is the hell and we can't add root and a hell and ball look do you know pro a hat all the to go in a ball look and a coin stock and can you do you look at a company and more action is jack I guess if it is a we tall is lay Lena crumbs from a from a word on the hand Chevy general but in this macaronic a car Hishing in Naraka to ha, my Brina Davila not as a real chinish jack, can Helena show, Hashina General to Yalhamur, and Naraka chin, a dull chimichil, a hoyer snock gacking, Hanyella, a fag, a hoyer snock as a vat. So Hamiswil get a good Kutrumahan, a narut, a Yanu cola, Kuchimuchel of Jem, a Kujok, Barak Yanu, Asna Helena show, I guess, 
close to the art le levy cook jawank of fame because the health new crochet at kianlichen honigred nash to fat no hunya in her cue honish your max one top less did thank you chair yeah it's it's hardening to hear the discussion here everyone's on the same page i think the the talk about the community working together with the council i mean that's what we should be doing anyway so it's, i think working in partnership putting across that strong message because we all have the same issues here um i think we're we're planning on writing a letter to the, the prime minister uh, on this very matter um and i think we're, that's where we're going to have to go because sse and Ofgem have let us down too many times we need to just be a bit stronger and trying to come to a solution um for, for our communities uh like I say, most of the questions and points I was going to make have already been raised, so it's, it's good to hear that everyone in, in the room is, is on the same page. So, and, and I agree with your, your proposed amendment as well. Thank you, Leader. Councillor George Murray. Thank you. Would it be, I wonder, an idea to get off Jim and SSE up before this council to answer their decisions, answer to their decisions or to explain to us why they're treating us with such disdain. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Well, something that we've been trying to do is to get them around the same table so they're not playing us off against each other. Um, what? How are we getting on and trying to organise my meeting? Thank you. Yes, Chair, we, we've engaged with them both trying to do you know exactly that to, to get them up here. They, they've, They've both been here on separate occasions, but when you talk to them in, in a separate room, they will all say it is the other one to blame, nothing to do with us. We need to have them both in the same room so that we hear them explaining you know, exactly what their position is and to allow the other, uh, the other body and ourselves you know, to test the, the propositions that they, they are making. To, to my mind, over the years, both of them are absolutely at fault. Both of them, however, are uh, uh, essential to delivering a solution uh, and we need to get round the table with them to try and work a way to that solution. Thank you. Any other contributions? If not, oh sorry Vice Chairman, my apologies. I keep, I don't want to look into my right. Yeah. Thanks Chair. Yeah, uh, I mean I can only agree with everything that's been said here just now. Uh, I think we need to go to Scottish Government, SSE off Jim, in the strongest possible terms, and as Councillor McCormack pointed out, this has been going on since 2003. Um, and community projects have been almost stymied at every turn just now because they're in a catch-22 situation, as I was just speaking with uh, the director here. Uh, the goalposts keep moving. They, they keep asking for demonstrated need before they can actually go ahead and do something. And now every time the goalposts move, these projects, they, they can't hit. What they're aiming for, because the pricing uh, structure changes, the, the regulatory structure changes. So whenever they're looking to build a project, as the goalposts keep moving, they lose heart and they're wondering, well, if, if there's no transmission link to the mainland, why would they bother to continue with a community project? And then when there's no community project, self Jim will turn around and say there's no demonstrated need, so we're not going to give you um, uh, a, 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 an enhanced connection. So the, the, the whole Catch-22 situation is so detrimental to smaller projects, particularly in looking to develop and get themselves onto a grid which is full to capacity and doesn't look to be expanding because, as Ofgem keep pointing out, show us the demand uh, and we will consider it. And then the, the, the demand cannot be there because of the regulatory impediments to it. So we've, we've been fighting this for 20 years, and the biggest impediment to the whole thing is Ofgem. It's crazy. Between Ofgem and Caledonia McBrain, we're going to be driven back into the dark ages. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Any other further questions? If not, very quick. Yes. Thank you. Um, some time ago, um, as part of work that we were doing through the Poverty Action Group, we had a meeting with Ofgem. Um, we weren't. We were talking, of course, mostly about fuel poverty, and I'd like to ask a question about fuel poverty later, if I may. Um, and and one of the points we were making 
uh, to them uh, related to the interconnector and so on. And at that time, the interconnector was down. And at that time, they said, off Gem that they had encouraged SSEN to build two interconnectors to Sky. They had no objection to that. And th there is no fundamental objection. And I mean, I understand the point that Councillor McLean is making, um, but the, the point is that we should be arguing for a system which benefits us, so that if there isn't a sufficient capacity going from Sky South, we should argue that that should be enhanced. Why shouldn't we argue that it should be enhanced mm -hmm. it, if it's to our benefit? And we we have the best resource in the world and we're not allowed to use it. And we're not allowed to, for our own local people to develop their own uh, ideas in regard to it. So, you know, the, the point you're making about off and SSEN is that they, they speak with forked tongue. Yes. They just do that. And, and, we, and I agree with Councillor Murray, we should get them in the same room and have a good go at them. Thank you. That's what we need to do. Absolutely, Mr McCormick. Thank you. So the recommendations for that item, um, as far as this committee centres are concerned, uh, 3.1 for noting and, and the additional two recommendations that were outlined at the start of the meeting. It's for your agreement. I do agree with that, Chair, but, but I wanted to ask the question on fuel quality, if I may. Can, and can we leave that until the item on maybe housing? Uh, okay, I'll take you in. I'll take you in just now. Thank you, Chair. It's just um, there is a reference in the document to <coughs> the process of going to tender to appoint a new managing agent. Now, the, there's no point in appointing a new managing agent if we do not have permission from the Scottish Government, as I understand it, to insulate our houses. And I was just wondering if we'd managed to achieve some sort of settlement in regard to that. Thank you, Chair. Um, as members might be aware, we've had discussions with uh, the Scottish Government and various partner groups over the summer uh, following Teague stepping back from the insulation um, programmes that they delivered for us uh, over the last nine or ten years. Um, the stage we're at at the moment is we've had uh, some useful discussions with uh, other providers and uh, we will shortly begin uh, out to tender to try and appoint a new managing agent for the the, uh, the, 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 the Energy Efficient Scotland scheme, which used to be called the HEAP scheme, which members will be familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, I, again, it's been it's been a challenging process to do that uh, because of the kind of issues that TIG encountered. Um, but we're sort of um, uh, hopeful that uh, there will be organisations out there that will be able to deliver that programme for us on, on the islands over the next year or so. Uh, we'll certainly keep the members, uh, keep the committee updated in progress with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stava. Chair, I just want to, to raise a point to, uh, regarding the medical adaptation. I don't know if it's the medical adaptation grant. Uh, uh, I must say, since my election here, that was one of the most common points I've been uh, been contacted with in US. And if we could, obviously, we're all aware that uh, the pressure that the, the 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 grant is under at the moment, but also we're we're aware how uh, important the medical adaptation are, and in fact, not just important, are vital sometimes for for the life of uh, uh, as, as, you know the people that require them. So. Um, uh, I, I don't know, Director, I'm just asking what's the, the situation at the moment in terms of funding. Uh, I know, uh, I think Mr. Watson uh, been approached him a few times and, you know, obviously saying that the money's run out. Uh, so people that require. Thank you. Mr. Watson, do you want to come in? Thank you, Chair. Um, members will recall we had a useful discussion about the situation at the, the informal meeting of the committee uh, a number of weeks back. Um, we have been working with our colleagues in the, the joint board uh, to try and see if there's any opportunities for funding, but it's proving to be really, really challenging. Um, I think from uh, from our, our own department's point of view, we've uh, exhausted all the, the sources that we had available for funding. Uh, they've been brought into the 
the the budget uh, for the uh, for medical adaptations. But we reach a stage now where we have got to have a, a, a freeze on medical adaptations. It's not a situation we'd want to be in, but we just don't have the funding to uh, award a, a, any more grants for the rest of this year. The the budget we did have left for this financial year is now being fully committed. Uh, and at the moment, we've probably be, got about 35 cases uh, that would normally be getting approved, but we're going to keep them on hold just now. Obviously, that will have an impact on people's quality of life, um, and it's it's something that uh, uh, we I don't think anybody involved in the process would like to be in this situation just now. So um, we're, we're we're scratching our heads a wee bit about where we could find uh, additional funding for the the process. Uh, I know there's discussions on the way about the capital programme for next year as well, but we understand there's going to be a significant amount of pressure on that uh, budget as well next year. So it's likely we'll have the same sort of issues running into the next few years as well. So um, sorry, I can't be of, uh, have more, more good news, but it's, it's just one of these things we're in just now where it's, it's a real struggle finding funding to keep the, 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 um, the, the medical adaptations going. Mr McKenzie? Oh, sorry, Miss. Okay. Do you want to come back in? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I do share the frustration and I do realize the pressure that the budget is under. But in terms of, you know, people that are going through uh, uh, this medical requirements and they need the adaptation even at, in the discussion with the education committee yesterday we heard mr libby talking about mainland pl placement and 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 how could some uh, time the lack of medical adaptation will lead to medical pl to to mainland placement for some of the youngster which in itself could be a lot costly uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering, obviously, as, as, as a group, as a call ourselves, uh, we need to look at uh, give the, this issue some priority and we need to look at maybe, I don't know what are other avenues to, to, to free or release some funding that maybe uh, could be used for, uh, you know, to deal with this emergency as I see it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kiva. Thank you, Chair. I think from an officer perspective, we've now exhausted, you know, every every potential pot or every potential, you know, avenue of, of funding. Uh, we can see both internally with the Corley and in discussion with the, the joint board. Uh, uh, as Mr. Watson said when he was concluding, you know, we are now beginning to put the capital programme together and we are putting you know, a significant ask into that capital programme for medical adaptations. Um, you know that, that the capital program is small, however, and it's going to be under men, uh, immense pressure from all, all kinds of different asks and, and different services. Uh, but we would hope to be bringing something uh, in, in, on the capital program to to uh, committee and to the coroner over the next two meetings. And of course, at that time, it'll be up to members to take decisions uh, around priorities in, into the capital program. But certainly from our perspective, I think this is one of the critical areas where we think it is absolutely essential for a significant level of budget to be made available. OK, thank you. Mr McKenzie. <clears throat> On the same, the same point, um, I take it that any application that was already uh, approved earlier on in the year um, will be going ahead uh, or has have gone ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, any cases that have gone through the process and have been approved, uh, the, we've committed funding for these cases, so so they will be um, uh, able to go ahead. Um, uh, but th that, that was one of the key priorities we had as we, we realised there was going to be pressure on the budget. We thought it was important to make sure that those already in the pipeline had a, a chance of getting the, the works done, so we, we can confirm that. Thank you. OK, thanks very much. Again, the recommendations are 3.1 for noting as far as this committee's uh, interests are concerned, and we have the two additional recommendations for your approval. I'm proposing we have a 10-minute comfort break and come back at 10 past 11. Thank you.
Item five is here. Item five is the has Akersich Harbour and Pier Infrastructure Improvements. The application to the UK Seafood Fund Infrastructure fund, uh, Scheme. Report seeks approval of the de detailed design work and to proceed to tender for an application uh, to the infrastructure scheme. An update on the current position with Vathrasi and Leverborough Harbour developments are also provided in the report. And the report will also be considered at policy and resources this afternoon. And Pete Middleton is here to speak to the report and answer any questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a report uh, on an important peer development at Akersage to establish a basis for an application to the UK Seafood Infrastructure Scheme, which requires a confirmed tender result as the basis for the costs in the application. Um, the proposals would safeguard the life of the peer for the next 30 years or so, um, but also develop further berthing by extending the pontoon and installing an attenuator at the outer end of the pontoons. Uh, unfortunately, as part of the funding package, it contained uh, the Regeneration Capital Grant Fund application, which we were unfortunately unsuccessful with at the first stage application. Uh, so we'll need to look at securing alternative funding or rescaling the project if, if that's not possible. Uh, I have been in contact with HI and they're discussing the project internally, so there, there are other possible routes for for uh, plugging the fund the potential funding gap. Uh, but as you can see, achieving a successful application to the UK Seafood Infrastructure Fund is is central to uh, progress with the project. Um, and just by way of brief update, there's a couple of paragraphs at the end of the report just on similar harbour developments that are will hopefully be taken forward uh, through various organisations, but not to probably at the same time scale as this. Yeah. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Pete. Any questions or observations on that? Uh, Mr. Mr. McInnes. Yeah, certainly I welcome the report and a bit disappointing, you know, that the RCGF application has not been successful. However, it's good to hear that uh, high have been approached because they are involved in the other two projects, the the one at uh, uh, Battersea and at Leverborough and as an area, uh, has over the years suffered significant decline since the high days or the heading season and was identified as an area within the first initiative at the edge. Uh, pilot areas that were uh, identified and it's heartening you know that we've reached this stage certainly the the proposal on the design is very good and uh, the other plus point to Eriski and South used in particular is that we've got a young breed of fishermen coming up through the ranks all assisted through the fisheries investment scheme which we heard about earlier on and Joe was involved in the development. So I think this is an excellent project and hopefully you know that the UK Seafood Infrastructure Fund will give a positive response to it. And I think that's why it's important that the leader made reference to, you know, the letter that goes to the new Prime Minister that they recognise the special needs of island communities and how we are disadvantaged particularly with high transportation costs and energy costs. So I certainly welcome and support the recommendation. Absolutely, Mr McInnes, thank you. Any other questions? If not, the recommendations are at 3.1 in, in so far as this committee's interests are concerned for the members to agree. Thank you. Now we went on to item six, the short term let scheme. The report seeks approval for a short term let licensing policy detailed in Appendix 1 to allow the implementation of a licensing scheme which all local authorities must have in place for 1st October 2022. The report seeks further 
further seeks a grant delegated powers to the Dep Deputy Chief Executive to carry out all the functions associated with the scheme to increase the licence fees annually in line with inflation. And Colin Fraser will speak to the report and answer any questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you can highlight, it, the, the scheme is mandatory. We have to have the scheme in place in, in a couple of weeks' time. So the policy outlines the, the, the kind of detail of the scheme. The report details the areas that we can, uh, that we do have flexibility over. Uh, the first of these highlighted at 7.1, 7.2, the license duration. So we've gone for a three year license and the fees are at 7.2. They are some of the home lighting and sharing fees are slightly reduced from the, the figures that we put up the June series, so we have reduced them down. They are um, in, in terms of kind of other local authority fees, some are still setting them. We are lower than Orkney, but we're higher than Shetland. Um, we're lower than most of the other mainland authorities as well. Though. So the other area we've got kind of flexibility was was with occupancy limits. So we've gone for a, under two year olds don't count in terms of occupancy and we've added three additional conditions on there just to ensure a kind of solid fuel and oil boilers are treated the same way as gas fires. So one for nuisance and disturbance and just a general question and uh, safety for equipment provided for guests. So happy to take any questions from a member. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. Councillor McCauley. Get used to this one day. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, very good report. Um, especially happy about that when you change the, the rule about the under 10s to under two year old. That makes perfect sense. And and uh, with, with especially with regard to fire hazard or overcrowding. Um, can, can I ask? There's, Obviously, are we funding this ourselves, and what, what's the rough costs of that, or just approximately? Do you think? Um, obviously, I think that the, uh, do we keep the the funding ourselves that that the, the from the from the licenses fees? Thanks. Thank you, Chair. The scheme is totally self-funded, so we haven't had any kind of additional funding from Scottish government to do it. Um, it's all cost recovery. So the fees were kind of based on the number of staff and kind of facilities we need to administer it, based on kind of provisional numbers of 600 um, applications. So again, we we'll probably will be reviewing that over the number of years. It's a three-year license, so by the time the, the renewers are due, we can review the fees there to see how many applications are and how it's been funded. Thank you, Mr. Fraser. Any other comments or questions? Not the recommendations. So far as this committee's interests are concerned, are for members to agree at 3.1. Next item is the excuse me, the annual assurance statement 2022. The report seeks approval of the annual assurance statement in respect of landlord services provided by the Kona for submission to the Scottish Housing Regulator by 31st of October 2022. And Angela Smith will speak to the report and answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this is a report that comes uh, to committee annually, uh, just to, to state that the Corla is compliant with the housing services that we provide. Um, 5.2 at the report gives sources of assurance that you might expect to see, and uh, 5.4 in the report. Um, gives an overview with uh, all the elements that the Corla is compliant with. Um, the Corla is a stock transfer authority, so our statement is much less involved um, than an authority that might have stock, and it largely covers our homelessness services. Um, we're also required to be compliant with uh, equalities and human rights legislation, um, and this is covered at section 7 of the report. And I'm um, happy to take any questions from anybody. Thank you, Angela. Questions from members? Recommendations then? for your agreement at 3.1. Item 8 is the Housing Need and Demand Assessment 2023 to 2028 update. The report is for noting and provides an update on the progress against uh, the Housing Need and Demand Assessment that is currently being undertaken by Housing Services Team. And Angela is here again to answer any questions members may have. Thanks, Chair. Um, 
So just that really an update on where we are with the housing needs and demand assessment, which is known as the HINDA. Um, so work towards the HINDA, the next HINDA is well underway. Um, it's due for completion in the autumn and prior to presentation to the committee in November uh, 22, um, with submission to the Scottish Government immediately after thereafter, if it's approved. So since the last update in June 22, um, the Housing Market Partnership has met four times to consider various aspects of the HINDA's development. Uh, the Housing Market Partnership will meet at least another three times prior to the HINDA's completion. And there's an overview of where we are with the different stages at table 6.2. Um, following analysis, it was agreed that the two housing market areas in Stornoway, um, in the two housing market areas, which are Stornoway housing market area and the rural housing market area will continue to be used for this HINDA. Um, but work will be carried out in the future to investigate the potential of creating further housing market areas, for example, separating Broad Bay out of the Stornoway housing market area. And at one of the housing market partnership meetings, it was agreed to carry out two surveys, one on general housing need and another one on housing need in the business community. The original closing date was the 19th September, but we've been getting quite a lot of uh, pertinent information back, so we've decided to extend the closing date to the 30th of September, which is next Friday. Um, and I can give you high level responses, high level information on the kind of things that we've been receiving back thus far. So. In terms of the general survey, we've had 130 respondents so far. The main reason given for housing need is upsizing and overcrowding at 28% and people wanting their independence at 22%. 44% said that the need was immediate. 49% said that the kind of house we would prefer is uh, a home with stairs. Um, and 26% required a house without stairs. Um, in terms of the size of house required, 36% required three bedrooms, 32% required two bedrooms, and 24% required four bedrooms. Um, in terms of the kind of tenure that people would like, 35% uh, want to rent from a housing association like HHP, 22% wanted to buy in the open market, 10% were interested in rent to buy, and 11% were interested in shared equity. Uh, and in terms of the areas that people want to live in, 27% want to live in Harris, 23% want to live in Stornway, and a further 19% want to live in rural Lewis. 37% um, stated that the greatest barrier faced was a lack of homes to buy or rent in the area that they wanted to live in. 30% 30, 30 said financial factors were a barrier to them, um, the cost to buy or to build and the expense of renting as well. And 10% said second homes or Airbnb was the greatest issue that they faced. In terms of the business survey, we've had 27 respondents, which is quite good. 10 have been from Harris, four from Barra, three from South Uist, two from Nace, two from Uig, two from North Uist, one from Pathk, one from Bernard, and one from Ben Bekula, and one general response. Um, and in terms of the sectors that they represent, we've had eight from community land and um, community land trusts. We've had seven from food and drink. We've had seven from tourism and hospitality, three from health and social care, two from construction, one from education, one from social enterprise, one from retail, and one from a community council. And the impacts that they have um, told us that are having on the business communities that they can't source workers locally and business growth has been held back as a result of having um, not having adequate housing in their communities that they, they live and work in. They're having to look locally for staff rather than further afield and the local pool is diminishing because the cost of housing in the area, uh, there are fewer and fewer homes available as well. In terms of new staff recruitment, it's been problematic because it's difficult to source accommodation for them. They're unable to take on graduate trainees. They're having problems recruiting care workers as they're, as they're unable, unable to find accommodation for them. And many respondents across both surveys mentioned that house, there's a housing crisis in Harris, and this concurs with the survey that HHP carried out last year. So I'll make full results available to you as soon as we're able to compile them uh, once the survey is complete at the end of September. The HINDA is on track to be presented to the November Committee and submitted to the Scottish Government in early December 2022 if approved. So happy to take any questions you've got. Thank you, Angela. Quite a diverse range of feedback there. Members of any? And Rina. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Angela, for the report. Very detailed. Do we have a list of the amount of properties in the Western Isles that are habitable, Airbnb, 
and uh, hold delete. I think we'll be able to get that. I can't tell you off the top of my head, but I should be able to get that information for you. Okay, thank you very much, Angela. Just, I think it's uh, actually quite worrying the way the housing situation is going in the Western Isles. You know, the amount of um, holiday lets and Airbnbs and empty properties right throughout the islands. And, you know, just there's a, there's a, there is a housing crisis and young people just cannot get on the property ladder. Yeah, it's very, very worried. Yeah, and that's something we've We've discussed mm -hmm. at, the, at the seminar we held as a committee in August. We were discussing that and how we address these issues. And the next item, or the following item, will be the, the, around the strategic plan we're submitting to the Scottish Government and trying to address some of the issues that have come up in that survey. Uh, but we've got a long way to go. Mr. McInnes. Yeah, thanks very much for that detailed report and clearly it illustrates, you know, the, the barrier to what all businesses seem to be indicating is access to labour and they're just not able to develop their business in all the sectors from the construction industry, hospitality, food and drink, which is evident, you know, in the report. And I would say it's um, very, very important that wherever types of accommodation are provided that they are near, that they don't have to travel too far to work. And um, I would say one of the biggest barriers to folk coming into the area has been um, immigration and the Richard one size fits all immigration policy that clearly doesn't suit island needs. And I think as a caller, we should be able to or we should be influencing uh, UK government and Scottish government on the specific special needs of island communities if they are going to thrive and prosper because they can't develop without in-migration and in-migration and people coming in must have a job and they must have a place to stay in. So I think that clearly illustrates the serious crisis we do have in housing provision for folk coming in and if at all possible you know that we should lobby at the highest level making sure that uh, we can import labour because if we look back to Stormy as a town Pakistani community came here in the late 50s and 60s developed integrated well into the community and as a community we have seen good integration of those that have come in from Europe. Some of them have developed their own businesses here in the town and Syrian refugees. And I think as a, an island community, we are welcoming and to integrate more in will require housing. And that should be a key priority in going forward to allow the business businesses in the islands to thrive and prosper and the population to increase. Councillor Stewart. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm not a member of your committee, but uh, thanks for the report, Angela. Um, I think you said that the highest uh, Harris was 27%. Uh, so that, that was the highest figure in that of people wanting homes. And, and yet, um, I believe that when I'm a member of, of the HHP board, and yet we're getting told that there's no demand in rural areas for, for housing. And yet this uh, survey and study shows that there is. I think uh, we should be putting more pressure on HHP to build houses in these places, to build houses in Harris. I mean, Harris has been struggling um, and other uh, islands, uh, struggling for, for labour, struggling for staff. They can't get staff. Now, if we're not going to build houses when there's a clear demand for them, no matter what other people say, we have to build them where there is a demand. And there will be no demand unless there's houses. So we have to we have to sort of maybe work. Uh, I suppose you are sharing these figures with HHP. I don't know, but I think really we have to work and get push them to 
built homes in, in uh, the rural areas. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Absolutely. Agreed. Not together. Councillor Finnegan. And then Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Not a member of your committee. Yep, just to go along with what Finley's just said there, um, it's, um, it's been a massive issue in Harris and still continues to be. I mean, for example, the distillery is sort of expanding. So looking, it needs 30 new jobs potentially and is now looking to move its bottling operation to the mainland because it can't get the staff. And it's absolutely critical now, really, really critical. And I would certainly support everything that Finley says in terms of trying to push HHP to do more because we've proved time and time again that uh, there's a need and there's a sur the survey's going on at the moment and I'm pretty sure it'll prove that there's a massive need in Harris, so thanks. Thank you. Mr Finnegan, uh, Councillor Fraser. Thank you, Chairman of your committee. And just following on from Councillor Finnegan and indeed Councillor Stewart, would it be an idea to invite a representative from HHP to the next meeting of um, the Development Committee? And to answer some of these points expressed by the last two members. I'd have no objection to that, Councillor Fraser. There is dialogue continually with, <coughs> with HHP among officers, and we have representatives on HHP board, but absolutely, I think there's, the more there's a closer working relationship, the better. Mr. McSween online. Yeah, Tablage, how much could you come about HHP? I guess I'm a comment on the last three. I have to sing for for him and he was and I'm a smoker in the middle of the HHP gefame fianish vi achkesen. So I guess she knew fianish a conto. Can you ever gra or has she got a part of her own waiting list? So my little F waiting lists have first the HHP nor she gra can you fianish achinje gevel gevel fame et tetus and horse. I'm a smoker map high hot guy. I guess uh, there's no waiting list. Och kriget nyach at the waiting list on the as an harapard shark on the scalp by Czech and the kind of Jason Herrick. So they get to call as an Herrick at that. Um, her map shock of mine, you know, countries. I guess, ach, she would, I'm sure it would just cut to me. My hat doing it on the ground, nach, 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 so I'm sure in the fear and I'm just meaning to have HHP clarke. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, th I also welcome the report. Good report, but there aren't any surprises in it. It's only what what we already know. Uh, I think back to I think it was May 18 when then the housing minister, Kevin Stewart, was in Zimbara. And uh, there was a waiting list then of, I think, 34 houses. And he says, if there's a waiting list of 34 houses, we should be building 34 houses. So, you know, things haven't changed. Personally, I don't think, and, and unless HHP change their attitudes, we're, we're not going to improve. The, we're, we're a watch with housing money, but we can't access it. There there are plenty of other ideas and proposals kicking about, but there's no flexibility in the Scottish Government money, and I think we should be putting pressure on the government to to put flexibility and to to create more localised island based housing initiative things and Dare I say it? Should we be looking at having a housing seminar uh, or a, a follow-up to to what we had in in Baikala in November eighteen? I think it was that we were we were supposed to have a follow-up on, but because of COVID, that never happened. And we we should look at a more focused uh, housing. I agree. I agree. Housing seminar or whatever. I agree, Mr. McGee, entirely in terms of a follow-up conference um, to focus sharply on, on what you've been saying there. And representations have been made to the government and will continue to be made to the government yeah. for more flexibility around how we spend this money and how we can you know, use our own initiative to, to address you know, the issues that have come up in this survey. 
thanks very much for your contributions on that. And I think that. Sorry, Vice Chair. Sorry. I keep forgetting. Yeah. Um, can I agree with thanks, Chair? Can I agree with the, the, the folk have called for a, a, a meeting between the Corla and HHP? Um, I'm at a loss to understand why we seem to be working across purposes here when we're, we should be working together to deliver a solution to housing for the Western Isles. You know, it's, it's bad enough that we talk about depopulation and sustainable development, etc., in terms of uh, off gem, Calmac, etc., and we can't even sort out our own housing issues. How do we have a survey that tells HHP or two separate surveys that have been conducted and HHP have one that tells them one thing, possibly to suit their own ends, and we have one that tells us a completely, completely different picture. We need to knock heads together here and deliver a working solution, you know, and excuse the pun, get our house in order as a local authority and a housing authority and deliver working solutions where they're needed, uh, particularly in rural areas. And I think a sit down meeting with HHP is the only solution. We, we need to be driving this as well. You know, we need to be, we, whatever levers we have uh, with HHP, we need to be starting to pull them and quickly because we're in danger of w watching fledgling businesses here crumble, particularly as Councillor Finnegan said down in Harris uh, and in other rural communities where people are looking to develop their businesses, but they can't get the housing for the staff. Uh, fledgling businesses like the, the, the brewer, uh, the distillery, um, the tourism industry as well. So, you know, we're, we're in danger of, of not supporting this by not providing the housing. I think we need to knock heads together and uh, find solutions and quickly. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Reid. So, members are asked to note that report. Thank you. Item nine is the Housing Options and Homelessness Annual Report. For 21 22. The report is for note and provides an update on the housing options and homelessness issues covering year 21 22. And Lorraine is here to speak to the report and answer any questions. Thank you, Chair. Yes, just a, a few issues to highlight. Um, so, homeless presentations have remained consistent now for the, the last three years. Um, and relationship breakdown continues to be the main cause of homelessness in the Western Isles and nationally. Um, one area of concern is that we are seeing an increase in the amount of households presenting where it's, it's only the main applicant that's asked the question, but mental health is becoming an increasing area of concern. Last year, out of 153 applicants, 67 or 44 percent stated that they had mental health issues. So that has uh, ongoing implications for support. We are making progress towards our rapid rehousing transition plan more in some areas than in others. We have seen a reduction in the backlog of the numbers of people waiting for an offer of permanent housing that reduced from 99 to 79 uh, for the same date in the year. That's really encouraging. That was largely due to an increase in the overall allocations being made in the Western Isles. The pressure continues in particular on one bedroom and four plus bedroom lists. Uh, that's where the greatest demand is and the availability of housing uh, with the, the pressure uh, continues there. So HHP have agreed to continue um, to allocate at least 25 one bedroom properties in the Stornoway area to homeless households for the year ahead, which will hopefully ensure that figures there do not continue to increase and we see a, a downward trend. We now have six housing first tenancies in place. So housing first is where somebody's allocated a permanent tenancy. That's people who have multiple and complex needs and require a high level of support. We have six in place now. They are all currently in Stornoway. And um, finally, local connection. We had been advised by Scottish Government officials that it was going to be laid before Parliament on the 13th of September, modifications to the local connection provisions, where at present anyone who doesn't have a local connection can be referred to an authority where they do have a local connection. 
it is proposed that that is suspended and therefore we will have a duty to anybody presenting who is homeless. We will have a duty to house them permanently. Still some clarity is required on whether that applies to everybody from the United Kingdom or whether that just applies to people who present from another authority in Scotland. Obviously the 13th of September we were in a period of national mourning so um, there has been no advice given on when that will now be laid before Parliament but we do anticipate that that suspension will be taking place and coming to force in the very near future. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Maureen, any questions? Thank you for the update. Certainly, we'll keep an eye on those members that has to take note of the report. We now move to item 10, the strategic house investment plan. For 2023-24 to 2027-28, report provides an update on the development of the strategic housing investment plan of the ship, as we all have come to note, and seeks agreement to authorise the deputy chief executive in consultation with the chair and vice chairman of this committee to finalise the ship and submit the Scottish government by 29th October 2022. Anne is here to speak to the report and answer any questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this report uh, sets out the process involved in preparing our annual strategic housing investment programme, or the SHIP as it's commonly known. Um, members will be aware that the SHIP has to be submitted annually to the Scottish Government, and this year it's due for submission by the 28th of October. Uh, and we're currently working in partnership with uh, HSP and the Scottish Government to finalise it uh, for the end of October. Um, the main report uh, gives a wee bit of background in the process that we are engaged in just now. Uh, section 5 gives a wee bit of the background of why the ship is uh, the model that's used for uh, setting out affordable housing in our council area. Uh, section 6 of the report sets out information on the resource planning assumptions. That's the, the likely funding that could be available to the area uh, for affordable housing over the next five years. Um, at 6.4, you'll notice that uh, we have been notified by the Scottish Government that we will be getting uh, around about £8.5 million pounds, uh, a year for the first three years of the, the proposed ship. Uh, but the final two years, years four and five, uh, they haven't formalised the announcement of that yet. And we've been asked to use the, the year three figures for the purposes of planning. So hopefully uh, um, over the next few months, we'll get confirmation from the Scottish Government about the likely funding over the whole five-year period of the ship. Um, the report also <laughs> details uh, some of the, the challenges uh, and considerations that we have to deal with in preparing the ship. And so section 7.2 provides a list of bullet points of the key things that we uh, have to take into account uh, along with our partners in the Scottish Government and HHP. So just very briefly touch on some of these. Uh, obviously, the, the, the key uh, aspirational goal of um, having most houses developed in rural areas uh, is embedded throughout the ship. Uh, we try to make sure that we reach the 55% rural and 45% stornary split in the programme over the, the, the period of the five years. Um, we've also got uh, information about the innovative approaches to using the, the money that's available. The chair made reference to keeping uh, um, keeping a case to the Scottish Government of uh, getting flexibility to use the funding. Uh, on the back of discussions we had over the last year, uh, we've got uh, scope for uh, using some of the funding for bringing empty homes back into use uh, and also for looking at the partnership support for regeneration scheme with local developers. So that's two key, part, two key parts of the the, the, the affordable housing programme that we'll be building into the ship. Um, it's still a, a sizable challenge finding suitable land for affordable housing as well. The process is ongoing. We have regular uh, feasibility works carried out on various sites um, and uh, uh, we've been engaging with uh, local bodies, uh, the, the community landlords, local churches and creation committees to try and identify land. So that process is ongoing and we hope to keep that going throughout the, the life of the ship as well. Uh, we also uh, had to take account of a couple of issues relating to uh, construction costs. Uh, costs have increased substantially over the last 
uh, 18 months or so. Uh, and there's also been um, delays in, in uh, the supply chain for raw materials, uh, which has had an impact on the affordable housing programme. Uh, members will be uh, may be aware that there's a concurrent report going to PNR that looks at uh, the, the construction market volatility in terms of the, the increasing costs. Uh, and that sort of backs up the, the sort of the approach we've taken with the, the ship this year round. And the final bullet point is obviously the ship has to try and meet the, the council's local housing strategy. The, the new local housing strategy is in production, as uh, Angela said, uh, but the, the previous or the existing local housing strategy, affordable housing is one of the key areas, so the ship supports that as well. The appendix to this report um, sets out uh, the um, a wee bit of information on the, the type of information that has to be submitted to the Scottish Government. It's, uh, the ship, a large part of the ship is a narrative um, on the, the housing situation in the area and it shows how we comply with wider, uh, the wider strategies that the Council uh, is engaged in, not just the local housing strategy. Um, so the for, for the purposes of um, this meeting, we've got indicative figures in the appendix. Uh, this will, of course, change as we uh, work towards the end of October deadline for it through our discussions with HSP and the Scottish Government. But we put some figures in to give you a flavour of what, what the, the programme could look like. Uh, there will be some fine tuning going on in uh, bringing some of these programmes, for, uh, some of these developments forward um, um, over the next wee while. Um, but uh, at the chair's briefing, we had discussed the possibility of having a, a MAUG to uh, present a, a more detailed uh, ship to uh, the MAUG before it gets submitted to the, the Scottish Government. Uh, we'll, we'll certainly look at, uh, at that as well. And um, based on the discussion of the previous uh, item, uh, HSP have a standing invite to the MAUG as well, so it'd be good to have them at that MAUG as well, if possible, to have a chat about the programme. Uh, so the like I was saying, the, the appendix of the report uh, sets out the proposal for um, just over 200 affordable houses over the five year lifespan of this ship uh, and using utilising some of the or a, a substantial amount of the 42 million RPA that's available for that period. Uh, we will, of course, be um, getting, uh, uh, doing some of the fine tuning just now and that'll uh, give a, a final ship, uh, hopefully around the same kind of uh, uh, of, of new units uh, and with a, a good geographical spread throughout the islands as well. So every part of the Outer Hebrides gets an opportunity for new affordable housing. Um, happy to take any questions uh, your committee might have about the, the ship, Chair. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Watson, sorry. Any questions or observations? Uh, Councillor Mackenzie and Councillor Robertson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, a very good report and detailed report and <clears throat> encouraging report in, in many ways. Um, and I hope we don't have a problem at the end of the day that eight, eight and a half million per year over five years uh, will be considered too much money. That money has got to be spent in the next five years. Um, I think the the approaches uh, are to various um, landowners or you know patients committees, whatever. I think that um, should be should be pursued. And I, I'm surprised at communities who say we need more houses, but then <laughs> from the sounds of things, they don't supply the land. So there's there seems to be a, a, you know. A, a, a question of conflict there, um, and I hope that doesn't take too long to resolve. Um, I don't know how much money the um, HHP are get from this uh, quantity, but <clears throat> I understand they were only talking in terms of uh, 30 million or something, or 20, 25 to 30 million at one point. Uh, and yet, you know, there's a demand. Everybody said that here on different reports that there's there's a, con you know, a, a continual demand for new housing. Um, there was another couple of points. Um, uh, I voted uh, in the past on a number of occasions that the proportion. Uh, of 55, 45 in favour of rural areas should be uh, should be done, and that's that you know that's something that should be achieved by the end of the five year period. But obviously, it may be, and 
in view of the rapid housing uh, necessary. Um, it, it possibly should be the case that, that to achieve that, that maybe it would be more convenient from the whole point of view of the whole plan to do these uh, um, houses in the early, in the Sornaway area in the early year or so of the plan. Um, I don't know how, how uh, many approaches or how successful uh, Mr. Watson has mentioned a couple of points about um, you know getting extra agreement from the from the Scottish government. But for instance, something came up yesterday, and I thought this is something that you know give a bit of flexibility on the thing. A housing for um, the mainland applicants. Some could that be uh, something that we could approach the government for, say, look, we need we need a building for um, for, for these children and for also for respite. Um, so, you know, maybe we're thinking too narrowly in, in terms of just housing. I'm sure we're not, but uh, we're trying to broaden the thing out as much as possible to make use of the 42 million that that is going to be available over five years, provided we spend it. So I wonder if that's something that uh, approaches could be made. Um, Mr. Watson, briefly, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in, in terms of the use of the, the resource planning assumption from the Scottish mm -hmm. Government, that, that there are quite strict rules and regulations on what, what uh, um, it can be used for. Um, the, the bulk of it has to be tied in with work delivered by a registered social landlord. Uh, we, during the discussions uh, the, the, we, we had with the Scottish Government over the last 18 months, there, there had been a number of projects slightly out with the, sort of the affordable housing uh, criteria uh, that we'd suggested. Uh, there was, like a, for example, a, a, um, a, development, a proposed development in Tarbert for seasonal workers, that kind of thing, to see if we could get some flexibility there. Uh, but unfortunately, that, that, that wasn't uh, something we got uh, uh, a green light to go ahead with. So it's, it's just something we have suggested to the Scottish Government. We have explored it, but uh, um, we haven't been given the, the green light for that. Uh, although, like I mentioned, we've, we, ha we have got opportunities for bringing empty homes back into use uh, and uh, the partnership support for regeneration developments might have some sort of opportunities there as well. But it's something we have, we have regular discussions with the Scottish Government uh, about um, trying to maximise the, the RPA. And it's, it's something that that will be ongoing if something uh, comes to light, we'll certainly raise with the Scottish Government to see what kind of response we get. But so far, it's been uh, it's been focused more more on affordable housing rather than than uh, widening the net a wee bit. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Robertson. Yeah, it, just going back to a line of two point three, which refers to making best use of existing homes, including bringing empty homes back into use. Now, I've had quite a bit of correspondence from young couples that are currently living in rented accommodation, but have bought empty homes which are not habitable, but they end up having to pay council tax for the rented property and the the, the house, which is almost derelict, like, looks like a house, but they have to pay. So I just wonder, I've engaged with finance on this, but they tell me it's a kind of a national thing. Is there anything that can be done on that particular issue? I wonder. I don't know if you can. Watson. It's too many mics on, I think. Thanks, Chip. Uh, uh, yes, empty homes is something that there, there's, there's two specific projects that we're uh, uh, engaged in at the moment to try and get uh, a number of these homes back into use. Um, I, I made reference to the, the, the Corley Zone approach to bring a number of empty homes back into use every year. Um, for the, the, the purpose of planning, we're looking at maybe five houses a year to begin with, but possibly increasing that over time. Um, that would mean the council would be able to purchase houses using the RPA funding. Uh, and then uh, use some of that funding from the Scottish Government to bring the house up to uh, a, a decent standard. Um, then the property could be 
rented out to somebody or could be sold to a first time buyer. So we're looking at the fine tuning of that at the moment uh, with our colleagues in the Scottish Government. But uh, it seems to be something that would be quite an effective way of getting affordable housing into remote rural areas due to the number of empty homes we've got on the, on the islands. Um, there's also the project that TIG uh, have recently introduced. They were successful in getting funding from the Scottish Government to do a similar project uh, where they have been uh, awarded funding to carry out feasibility studies on about 20 empty homes uh, to try and see which of these could be brought back into use. So there will be a wee bit of an overlap between our project and the TIG project, but hopefully together we'll be able to get some uh, empty homes back into use. And uh, we, we, we thought it was really important that the, these were targeted in, in the most remote areas to try and make more of an impact rather than in, the, 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 in Stormy or the bigger settlements. Um, but it's two, two encouraging projects and we'll certainly keep the committee updated on, on how we're getting on with that. OK, thank you. Uh, Mr. Morrison, then Mr. McNeil. Thank, thank you, Chair. I mean, just following on from, from the ship, um, I think it's imperative that we keep the 55% ruler split for in the ship because the communities are fragile at best. But just a point for Mr. Watson, because Mackenzie and I were asked to attend a meeting with a landlord last week where they identified large pockets of land suitable for housing, what they deemed suitable for housing. Um, which goes against the grain of what we're hearing today, where land isn't available. This particular area, they've identified quite a few areas that would, they think would be suitable in various villages. Now, I think the problem is HHP seem to come back and say they deem the land unsuitable for one reason or another. Now, I think I probably raised this before, Mr Watson, but who actually deems that the land isn't uns is unsuitable? Do we have a say in that, or is that totally a digit piece autonomy? Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, yes, we're, we're involved in the process with HSP. The, the, the way we, um, we deal with land, uh, we've now got a, like a one-door approach, and the council takes the lead in any approaches that are made for land that gets offered up by community groups or by individuals. Prior to that, it could have been offered to HSP or TIG or to ourselves. So um, uh, working collectively, we've, we've taken this approach where uh, we would take the, the lead role in um, getting in touch with whoever's offered up the land. Um, if it looks like the land's got potential, uh, we carry out feasibility studies. Uh, these are jointly funded between HHP and the Corla, uh, and they're usually carried out by Tycoon Scal on behalf of HHP. So the feasibility study looks at the, the site, try to see if it's something that can be developed, uh, tries to give an, an indicative cost of developing, and also uh, looks at how many units could be put on a particular site. Uh, and during that process, that sort of identifies any constraints on the site, like the, the, um, the physical makeup of the site, uh, or difficulty with accessing services, or um, if it's going to be too expensive to develop. Uh, we're certainly noticing that there are more and more sites are too expensive to develop based on the, the threshold limits that are set by the Scottish Government uh, due to the, the increase in costs. So that's that's becoming more of an issue. Uh, more land has been deemed as being uh, not economically uh, feasible to develop. Um, but that's not to say that that could change in the future if uh, things improve and uh, the, the, the cost of living crisis improves, then some of these sites might be ones that could be looked at again. But at the moment, it's a joint approach between the Council and HSP to look at the feasibility of these sites. Um, if, um, if if this, the, the, the feasibility site comes back with a clean bill of health, then there's a good chance the sites will be developed for housing uh, by HSP in the, the coming years. Uh, but just the opportunity, we're always grateful for any any leads. So if, if members get approached by any members in the, the wards with land, we'd be delighted, delighted to hear about that and we'd certainly look at the, at the model to see what we could do. OK, Mr. Morris. Too many lights. Thank, thank you for that, Mr. Wharton. You are going to get invited actually to have a meeting with the landlord. Um, one of the questions of the follow on I would have is: Is it the number of houses that are act? Is a site if sites are too small, could that have a cost implication? Or could that make the land deemed unsuitable from a feasibility study? Or is it? Is it? You know, I was just thinking after we left the meeting, are the, are the sites have identified maybe for four houses. Would they be better coming to a site for, a, for maybe a larger scheme of 10, 20 houses? Would that take the cost element down? Or would that make it more attractive? 
Yes, thanks, Chair. Uh, yes, that, that, that's correct. It's uh, the, the economies of scale is an important part to play with it. Uh, Sometimes uh, a smaller development just wouldn't be economically feasible to deliver, and a larger one would would, would achieve these economies of scale. Uh, but then you come into the the issue we touched upon about demand in an area uh, as well. So some areas, um, ten houses might be too much, uh, whereas four or six would have been an ideal mix. So it's one of these things we have to consider very carefully in partnership with HSP when they're looking at at okay, taking the bank on forward. Thanks very much for that, Mr. McNeil, and then Mr. McLeod. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, there's been um, occasions when visibility studies have been have been conducted, and that the land that's been put forward has been deemed unsuitable. The the, the site I'm thinking about is in the process of having a house built there just now by by a private individual. So if a private individual can do it. You know that that gets you thinking of what's happening because there's been occasions where land has been offered, and they've, they've there's there hasn't been any follow up. I've uh, I've had several people speak to me about that. Uh, we're also in an unfortunate situation where where we've only got one RSL for the Western Isles, and for those of us that are uh, know. That only through an RSL, uh, you, you can only work through an RSL. Could the council look at becoming an R RSL, or can the house council actually start building houses themselves, or is there a way, is there a mechanism that that can be conducted? Well, lots of flexibility. We're actually looking for. Yeah, well, to do that's well. That's uh, one of the things. We, yeah. Well. Uh, you we, know what? So, so we can start rebuilding our housing stock up again. Yeah. And another thing we can't go near is the 55-45% split. That's got to be kept. Thank but you. I think there was an overwhelming support to retain, to retain that split yeah. by the committee and by the council. Mr. Watson. Your light up, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, the the the, the opportunity of the Council to get involved uh, it's something that's come up um, quite often over the years in stock transfer. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, it's not something we could do in terms of being a manage managing agent for building houses and renting them out. Uh, one of the conditions of the stock transfer was that we'd give up our housing revenue account, which was the the account that uh, all council houses all councils have for their council houses. So basically, it was a case of if we transferred, we wouldn't be able to reopen the housing revenue account uh, in the future. Um, but there was scope uh, for, even, even though we wouldn't be a, a manager of council housing, there would be scope for the council uh, building council houses. Um, at the moment, the, the funding that the Scottish Government have available affordable housing, it's directed towards RSLs, but also to the councils who didn't transfer their stock, they can still build council housing. Um, but in, in, on paper anyway, the council could possibly have built council housing. But uh, when we did look at it, this has gone back quite a number of years now, it would have been far too expensive because we didn't have uh, the council house rent coming in to service the debt that we'd have to incur, incur to build the houses. So it's something that we didn't, we didn't pursue. Uh, I think it was 2007 or 2008 we last had a debate about this in the chamber. Um, so, um, so at, at the moment, it's not something that we could do in terms of having our own housing stock again. Um, I think that we, we are quite pleasantly surprised by the Scottish Government uh, allowing us to purchase empty homes, uh, uh, as mentioned uh, a week while ago. Uh, that was certainly something we weren't sure if we'd be allowed to do that. So it's good to know, but at least we've got that flexibility of uh, uh, getting engaged in, uh, in purchasing houses. Uh, for onward use, but at the moment it's not something we could do in terms of developing our own property portfolio. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr. McLeod and then Mr. McKenzie, and that'll be the wind up then. And I'll take in Mr. Finnick as well. Thank you. Okay. Cooper, the last one. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, just following on what, what Councillor Robertson was saying earlier about uh, council tax. Yes, there's a young couple over in our ward. Uh, similar similar circumstances where 
they're renovating uh, an old house that's on a few that's been out of crafting tenure, which shouldn't have anything to do with it anyway. But they're paying 200% in council tax for this house that's trying to renovate. They both live with each other's parents, you know, just now. Now, there can't be many people in the Western Isles, young, a couple like that, uh, doing this. I mean, is there any reason or is it possible for us to, sort of, to reduce that policy to 0% until that house is habitable? Um, habitable? habitable? Sorry, I'm getting tongue twisted here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sorry, I'm sympathetic with your issue, but it'd be appropriate to raise that at Policy and Resources would be the appropriate committee to raise. Mr. McKenzie and then Mr. Finnegan. Yes, Jim, well, the point I was going to come back on actually, and I, I did forget. Um, the island deal uh, is meant to help the three island authorities. And um, is there any effect from the island deal in this uh, that would assist us? You know, I don't know if the chief executive has a view on that. Thanks, Chair. Uh, not directly for uh, funding for new housing, but it will have an impact uh, through this of the various projects that will be stimulating the economy. Uh, that will take us back to the discussion we had about needing accommodation for expanding businesses. Um, so it's something that would be very useful in terms of making the case to the Scottish Government saying we've got the, the potential for growth in different sectors and in different parts of the island which will need housing. So it's 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 a uh, Quite a handy situation to be in. We've got that to that to call on. We can make reference to that in our um, development of our Hunda that Angela was talking about, and also next year's local housing statute as well. The fact that there's potential out there, there's some good, really, really good uh, economic development opportunities out there that will need a workforce and they will need housing uh, to uh, to operate that. So it's, it's it's quite encouraging from that point of view. But in terms of direct funding for housing from the island deal, that, that's not something that's available. Thank you. Mr. Finnegan. Thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, it was just asked, Mr. Watson, uh, is there any opportunity? I know it's maybe out of the question, but it's an opportunity for other organisations, the government, in, as part of their flexible uh, options, to look at other organisations um, instead of the RSL building. So in Harris, Harris Development, we, we can't wait any longer. So we, we're actually now, well, they're actually now looking at um, working quite quite uh, very quickly on, on actually trying to build their own houses. That, that we can't wait any longer. So. Um, I just wonder if there's any chance of any scope. And, and the other point was uh, just to come back on John Norman, what John Norman was saying um, in the in the last term, I was able to get uh, that situation of the council tax delayed for a particular constituent in Harris who had the similar sort of situation. So I think it is possible. Thanks. So maybe you can speak to Mr. McLeod about that. Yeah. Always. Mr. Watson, do you want to come back quickly on on the first point? Yes. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah. One of the things we did um, mention to the Scottish Government during the discussions was about the scope for other organisations, other partner organisations being able to uh, use some of the, the, the funding. But unfortunately, that we're told that won't be possible. It had to be uh, primarily through uh, an LSL. But there were a couple of projects involving um, community organisations that we thought had a good, a good opportunity, but th th these were knocked back at the time. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, members. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Watson and his team for all that hard work in putting the ship together and getting it ready for sale as it were. Um, we're prioritising a lot of things in terms of the land banking and the empty homes uh, programme and seeking more flexibility in how we can be more innovative and, and spend the money in the way we want it just to spend. So thanks very much for all your hard work on that. So the the report is for agreement there at, at 3.1. Item 11 we've, we've dealt with. Item 12 is reports outstanding and that's for noting. The next scheduled meeting of the committee will be on Wednesday 30th of November. I want to thank you for your attendance and for your... Sorry, Mr. Kiva. Make an observation, please. That doesn't require a response. I'm disappointed to see that Chief Executive is still here after the crofting chair charge package being brought forward on the excuse that they had to be somewhere else. Thank you. Well, I'll ask, I'll ask the Chief Executive to respond to that. Sorry, Chair, that, that remark does require a response. It does. I, I, I object to the implication that 
the, the meeting has somehow been manipulated. I had a clear unscheduled meeting between half past 10 and quarter past 11 with UK government regarding next week's Islands Forum, which I spoke to about which I spoke to the chair and it was kindly agreed to bring the matter forward. The fact that the meeting has gone on since that, since my meeting concluded and I'm now back in the chambers with the material. So I'm afraid I reject the implications of that, 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 that's, that somehow the meeting has been manipulated around my, my diary is, is a matter of record. And as you know, I make every effort to attend service committees wherever possible. I entirely agree with you, Chief. I entirely agree with you, Chief Executive, and the committee agreed. I asked the, for the committee's permission to bring this item forward so it could be accommodated for the Chief Executive's contribution to an advice on this subject. That's why the item was brought forward, and we all agree to that. Unfortunately, Mr. McKeever wasn't present. Thank you.